our thing. The mission for Tea Party Patriot Organization has always been to secure public policy in line with the Tea Party Patriots' three core principles to return this nation to a constitutionally based government. Number one, what is it? Our first core principle. We have personal freedom because we have limited constitutional government. Number two, we have economic freedom because we what? We support free market economics. And we have a debt-free future because, number three, we are financially responsible, not only personally, but at all levels of government. This has always been our voting guidelines to legislation and to candidates. Remember those three core principles. And if a candidate or a piece of legislation does not uphold those principles, it's not upholding our liberty. It's really pretty simple, but being humans, we can kind of complicate things, you know. But if we just keep that in mind, that is what this is all about. With tax day on April 15th coming up, and it being the 10 year anniversary of the current Tea Party movement, Jenny Beth Martin put out a message this month, which begins with a thank you. And I'm going to read it to you. She says, thank you for your efforts over the past decade. Our country and future generations are indebted to you, just as we are indebted to those freedom fighters that came before us. So make sure to take a moment in this busy life we all have to celebrate the gains we've had as a movement and the losses because it is an eternal battle. And as long as we are fighting, we are winning. So please help us this week by doing at least one of the following actions below. You can write a social media post. You can share with your friends about the Tea Party movement or maybe thank a, a legislator. There's a piece of uh, information on the table there that says maybe you'd just like to call a legislator and thank them for doing something, voting a certain way. It's upholding our liberty. Write the most letters to the editor. Frank Long can help you with that. He's got a nice little campaign going in CD6. We need to do this, folks, and be heard. Also write an email or a letter maybe to our senators and representatives and tell them we will always fight for freedom and we will always be fighting against socialism. Write an email or letter to your network encouraging them to recommit themselves to fighting for freedom and standing up to socialism. And the best yet is to plan a call or a visit to your senator's or representative's office, either alone or with a group of people, and thank them for what they are doing. We need to support them, folks, and help and guide them, and that is the most worthy thing that we can do. They need it. They need our support. This year, Jenny Beth says, is going to be an incredible year for us as we reflect on our past successes and make big plans for the next decade. Thank you for being part of this movement and for helping us to make our core Tea Party principles a part of the national political conversation. In Liberty, Jenny Beth Martin. table are some Tea Party Patriot uh, brochures. Uh, just like last month, I'm going to ask that everyone take a handful. Uh, just kind of sprinkle them throughout maybe public bathrooms or leave them somewhere in the checkout line. and Just let people know that this Tea Party movement is still alive. And it will tell them what we're about. That we're not racist and bigots and all that other good stuff. We try to, <laughs> try to say that we are. And while you are out there caught in an elevator, here's a little example of a, maybe a 30-second elevator speech that you can uh, share with people. Or maybe at Easter when you're with your family, maybe you'd like to just say something and really surprise them at how sane and stable we all are and how we're for everybody. So I'll take that if you, if you so wish. We got you covered here. We do encourage you to take photos tonight. Please post them on Facebook. Um, please uh, send them on over to the Liberty Tea Party Patriot site as well, and I'll approve them, and, they, and they'll get uh, downloaded. There's a lot of people who wanted to be here tonight but couldn't make it for one reason or another, so let's share all the good stuff that we've got going on. I do want to give you a heads up. We do have a power cord going on here, so be careful when you're walking by and you don't trip if you don't want that on uh, Facebook. I want to thank Izzy, who uh, is the manager here, who helped set this up for us, and she does a terrific job. We've got Zach, our server tonight. Thank you, Zach. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Sue Erickson is with us tonight. You're doing a wonderful job, yep, setting up that entry table and greeting people. She also made some cupcakes, but 
since they're homemade, we can't hand them out here, but at the end, I hear she's going to be handing them out at the back end of your car, right? And you can, and you can take them home. And what are they? I think, yeah, they're chocolate frosting and... Devil's food cupcakes with the chocolate frosting. So we cannot serve them in here, but seriously, she'll hand them out and you can take them home. <laughs> yes, yeah, we've got about 66, 68 of them, so you can take two. We're celebrating some birthdays. Um, so Louis didn't make it tonight. Louis Hill, all of you know him. Um, Louis's birthday was April 5th, and he turned what, 70? 75 years old. Many of you know Louie, and he's been a great um, supporter for a long, long time. And Mary Ann Laws. Oh, yeah. Today was the 4th. My birthday was April 4th. Thanks. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> I'll make you guess. Sue's got our little blue donation bucket over at the entry table. Donations, as you know, are the only means that keep our meetings going every month. We do have um, um, some efforts, uh, for instance, like now on C at CD3 on, on Saturday, um, I'm paying for a vendor table to be there to promote Liberty Tea Party Patriots. So we get these opportunities, and uh, and uh, we just really appreciate it. I want to thank you in advance for your generosity, and you all have been very generous on and off. We've also got a little separate fundraising deal going on over here. It's, it's uh, mainly new books and CDs and so forth, but if you feel like you'd like to leave with something for your donation. Here's your chance. There's some good, good things over there. So to begin, um, I would like to start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I am going to invite Don Baumgartner to come up and lead us in the pledge. We have a lot to be thankful and grateful for. I pledge allegiance to the flag the United, United States, States of America, and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, thank you. If you are currently serving in the military or have served in the armed forces, will you please remain standing? indebted and we thank you very much. And I'd like Frank Long, then from Carver County, to uh, lead us in prayer. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us and thank you for this week where you've given us a wide variety of weather. <laughs> thank you again for Monday. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching over those that are here tonight. I know the roads are a little rough and and it's a tribute to these folks that they, they made it here and uh, on, the, on the kind of roads that we've got out there tonight. So please watch over them when they go home. Thank you for those who are here to speak to us and serve us in leadership and help them to do your will after the contest is over and we have our leaders in place. In God's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Frank, very much. I think all your question cards have been collected. If you do have any more questions, feel free to fill them out. You can just hand them to me as I walk by. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I do want to introduce our Minnesota GOP Secretary, Barb Sutter, at this time. She's Yay! running for re-election. I invited her to say a few words. She did a terrific job at CD6. And I said, just go ahead and say what she said there. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> Check is in the mail. Make sure you hold it right to your mouth. Right to my mouth. Okay. Well, I, I'm Barb Sutter. I am running for a second term as MNGOP secretary. And looking forward, hopefully, to continue working with you and for you. All of you here are party activists and volunteers. Um, I know we don't want to continually look back, but we do still feel what happened in November, uh, both from a party standpoint and from a personal one. We're still looking back at that. Many of us worked hard, perhaps harder than we feel that we've ever worked before. And we did have bright spots. There's no question about that. But we felt overwhelmed by what we lost. But what that's done for us is that we have a challenge now of looking at new ways to do things. 
new ways to engage, make a difference. And I know that many of you, I certainly am as well, we're already getting starward, started and we're moving forward towards 2020. So um, my primary uh, focus as secretary would be in two areas. The first is what I call sharing and implementing best practices. We talk about that in terms of our BPOUs. And that's among our precincts and our Senate districts. Um, a lot of our organizations are doing very impressive work. And I would like to do my part to make sure that those things are picked up, listened to by our party, and that we then share that information with one another. I always say our, our BPOUs are really the building block of our party and the stronger all of you are in your BPOUs the better chance we have to win our elections so I think it's really important there's a lot of enthusiasm out there about regrouping and uh, people want to share what works best with them one of the trends that I've been picking up in Senate districts is partnering with other districts to create change and interestingly enough last night Randy and I were at a meeting where two CDs, CDs four and five, are talking about partnering with events. And I think it can only make all of us stronger. So we're looking at co-hosting events, fundraising together, and contributing for, to, to joint newsletters. It lessens the load on maybe some of the BPOs that don't feel like they have the amount of volunteers that they'd like to have. Um, I'm also working with a task force that we just formed grassroots activists from across the state. We're focusing on BPOUs and counties, and what some of the things we're looking at is how to recruit volunteers, finding good candidates, and strengthening communication, but there are more. But, so we've got some committees set up, and they are busily at work. So it's an example of how to identify some opportunities and rebuilding our party from the ground up. My second uh, focus is broadening the outreach of affiliates. Many of you know that I work with our affiliates, and I can tell you that they made some con uh, amazing contributions in 2018. And to build on that, we're setting some ambitious goals for our affiliates for this coming year, because they really want to be part of the winning team. And as I always say, they are not willing to cede the Metro to the Democrats. So I think it's time that we integrate them into our Senate districts, into our congressional districts, and it's my hope to make those connections. I think they can make a real difference. I know they feel that they can make a real difference in garnering more votes. And I think if we reach out to one another, I believe we can move the needle or I wouldn't be doing what I do. So again, my promise to you is this. And that is to continue to learn from you, value you. I always say we're a party of grassroots activists. Like all of you, I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid for this job. You sitting here are our strength. And we all need to be acknowledged as volunteers and made to feel rele be, rele be made to feel relevant. So I want to hear your thoughts. I have cards with me. If you don't have my phone number, my email. Um, I welcome your calls, your ideas. Um, if ever you feel that I'm not doing that, I need to know that from you too. So I always see it as the job of those on the State Executive Committee to take your ideas and carry them forward. So thank you for what all of you do here when you come. Thank you to Mary for doing this. You do an amazing job. I think we all value Mary as an incredible volunteer. <coughs> to working with all of you and I hope that I earn your support in my attempt to be reelected for a second term and thank you. Thanks Mary. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> we really are going to just kind of keep this moving along here tonight. There are three candidates Minnesota Republican Party Chair. They are all here this evening with us. We're so glad they could make it. Um, each will speak for up to five minutes. Mitch Rossell from CD5, 
I hope you know him. He's this oh evening's timekeeper. Oh wow. He's got a great system. We did this two years ago, too, and it worked out just slick. So um, just so you know, as candidates, just a couple of things. When I bring you up, you need to you know, pay attention to Mitch. <laughs> uh, make sure that your the microphone is up to your mouth like this, because when we start to do this, you can't hear anything. So you've got to keep it right up to your mouth. And, uh, and then you'll have everybody to hear, including Zach and Izzy. Nice conservative guy. Kids back there, voters. Get, you need to get them. I know what CD they're in. <laughs> <laughs> the mics, as I had them to you, were going to be live as well. So that means as soon as you get it, you know you're you're live. You can go. The first person that I would like to introduce to you this evening is Monty Moreno. He's from CD6. He, we know him from other campaigns in the past, and we did make it, Monty. So thank you so much for this great effort. My name is Bob I am from the 6th Congressional District, where I'm the Deputy Chair of Senate District 39, State Delegate, State Senate Delegate, and I've been the party for years, probably 30, 35 years. I've been a small business owner, but let me start at the beginning. I grew up in the inner city of St. Paul between the Arcana Projects and Mount Berry Projects, and arguably the poorest neighborhood in St. Paul. Out of the poorest neighborhood, we're the poorest family. Out of the poorest family, I was about the youngest. Eight kids, mom, dad, ten of us living in a two-bedroom, about 850-square-foot home. One bath, no shower. No big deal. Thank God I'm an American. But it taught me a lot of discipline, and it taught me how to do things right. And my parents loved this country. My dad served in the military, like many, many of yours. I grew up loving this country. And I became a boxer because I street fought almost every day of the week. Mm -hmm. It taught me a lot of discipline. It taught me how to accept victory and not ridicule the person who I've just defeated. And it taught me patience when I lost. But when you look at this party and the party chair position that we're at right now, we're in a world of hurt. And everybody can stand here and cheer and yahoo, but the fact of the matter is we need to do some work to get a change. If you do the same thing and expect a different result, you're fooling yourself. I produced a video today in Stillwater that at state central delegates alternates, raise your hand. Frank, I sent you a message today. That video will be released to you probably on Saturday. I hope to God you are all willing to roll up your sleeves and get to work if you want to be the majority. And I'm not trying to come down heavy handed or ugly or anything like that. I just want to win. I'm tired of losing. Anybody in here tired of losing? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. I mean, come on, man. We got to reach out in the fifth district. We need to be the tip of the spear and actually push right in and we need to penetrate the liberal stronghold on the inner city. Within the program of Win One that we produced today, there is an outreach to the 5th District, 6th District, and there's also outreach for money, lots of it. But it's going to require work, and it's going to require effort and tenacity. You can't roll over and wet on yourself. There's so many people in this Liberty Tea Party who've stepped out and thought, you know what, I'm not going to be a Republican anymore. I'm going to be this or that or some other party. Well, the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, we need to stick together if you want to win. Together we win, divided we fall. And I wish I had better news for you. But I'm running this chair only because I have children and I have grandchildren, as many of you. And if you want to win, I put out the program today, and it'll be released on Saturday. And it's a comprehensive program from top to bottom. I couldn't go into every detail. God knows, you know, you try to take a multi-generational. This is not a plan to win one election. This is a plan to win 100 elections. This is to make the Republican Conservative Party the majority in the state of Minnesota, not for now, not for one year from now, but for 100 years from now. 
This I, I developed the Aveda program. If you ever heard of Aveda, who's heard of Aveda? I, took, I, I, I developed the plan when the company was about eight to ten million dollars. I developed the program, and the program grew the company to $100 million. The program then grew it to $500 million. Then it grew it to a $1 billion. And they're still using the program as a multi-billion dollar company today. I developed this program in sense almost like that. It's a company that will continue, and this program will continue to grow and grow our finances as time goes on. But man, it requires will. You can't roll over and wet on yourself, and you can't do the same thing and expect something different. You better be willing to roll up your sleeves, get to work, and I will be the tip of the spear, and I will charge the hill. But we need activists, we need people to stand up and go and do something. I've also raised over a million dollars for charity, for cancer patients. Terry Ventura was our honorary chairwoman. But my time is up, so... Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you for your consideration. My name is Monty Moreno. Thank you very much. We can take up to a couple of questions here. Does anybody have a question for Monty? Okay, if you don't. I just wanted to know if Andy Noble was going to be on your team. We saw him last month. Right. We were with Andy last night uh, in St. Paul. Andy's program that he developed is goes hand in glove with the program that, that I have developed, that we have developed with the team. But yes, the information Andy has, Andy and I are working together. Our programs interface with one another in regard to outreach. When you look at the state of Minnesota as a whole, as Andy stated, we have roughly 5.5 million people, 3.5 in the Twin City area, and probably a little more than a million are people of color, whether black, Hispanic, Asian. And right now the opportunity for us to pick up the Jewish vote and the Jewish money is here right now because of our good friend Elon Omar in Minneapolis. Okay? And, and uh, so right now, you've got to figure, the people in Minneapolis, the Democrats, hate Elon Omar and they want to get rid of her because she really exposed the way Democrats really truly feel about the Jews. And now they want to get rid of her. The Republicans want to get rid of her. And so as far as I'm concerned, this creates a great opportunity. I mean great question. But that opens really a tremendous opportunity and a possible split in a really <laughs> new district. Good question. Thanks. Yeah. One more and they're all invited all candidates are invited to stay as long as they'd like the second candidate for the Minnesota Republican Party chair is Becky Hall and Becky did drive down through all kinds of weather to get here today <laughs> A, a postal worker because I, I escaped a blizzard in Duluth and then ran into sleet, rain, thunderstorm, I saw lightning, hail, you name it. I, I experienced all that weather today, but I'm here and I, I so appreciate being here once again. I so appreciate as a fellow Tea Party patriot all that you do um, for our fight for freedom, Mary. Thank you so much for offering up this only forum that we have um, for you to hear from the candidates. So I appreciate that. So. As Mary says, I'm, I'm Becky Hall, and I'm a former Champlin resident. As a matter of fact, I used to work at that McDonald's right across the street here. Um, I, uh, I grew up there. I was born in North Minneapolis and lived there until fourth grade. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself before I tell you why I'm running for chair. Um, I then moved to Brooklyn Center and then here in Champlin where I went to high school at Anoka. And I was raised by two parents who are who were and are still such hardworking people who taught me the values of hard work and that we live in a country that so blesses us with opportunities every step of the way. And we're lucky no matter where we come from, my family came from, from nothing. They, they, my parents didn't go to college. I was the first in, in our family to go to college. Um, 
they were married in high school and um, really worked hard all their way. So they were a, truly an instru inspiration to me um, when it comes to my values of hard work in this great country and, and the freedoms we celebrate. I marri married my, the love of my life, Pat Hall. He's an orthopedic surgeon um, and a former lieutenant commander in the US Navy, served 13 years. And we have five beautiful children, um, all conservative, which is quite a feat to have <laughs> five conservative, thank God. Um, and we live up in Duluth. And um, I graduated from the University of Minnesota. I have a, de a bachelor's degree in international relations and Soviet studies and a minor in Russian language. <coughs> and after graduation, I had the dream job of working for <laughs> Senator Rudy Boschwitz um, in his St. Paul office doing constituent services in uh, D.C. working for his chief of staff and then on his um, 1990 campaign as a field representative. And, you know, from Rudy, I learned what, what how important good policy is and how terribly important and incredibly rare it is to find good leadership and how important it is too to lead with a moral compass. He taught me so much. And as you can see, I left some information on the table. I have been involved in Minnesota politics for over 30 years here in, um, in GOP politics. And after the 2018 election, and with the encouragement of many to run for state chair, I decided to say yes. I believe that I was disappointed by those results. I truly believe that we can do so much better together. Um, I'm, I'm from the grassroots, like you. I spent, as you can see from my, um, my experience, my, my activism is at the grassroots level. I truly believe that, like Barb was talking about, that we need a party that supports more of those efforts that take place throughout Minnesota. I truly believe, as a team and a leader, uh, like myself as state party chair, to foster those efforts. I do believe in 2020 we could be uh, a more winning team than in 2018. I, I, there's plenty of opportunity working together throughout the state, and I just want to take my, my energy and my enthusiasm and my experience um, in developing a message, a vision together, a message that we can stand behind to fend off the left and, and the DFL in Minnesota, and another strength of mine as well is I love to help our candidates um, raise money. I would like to do that for the party. I'd like to um, be aggressive in eliminating our, our debt. I know it's, it's a manageable debt right now, but it's still debt. And once we get rid of it, we have more resources for our causes and our candidates. So I would be very aggressive at that as well. Um, let's see, I have 45 seconds left. What else can I tell you? I want to thank Kathy Burkett and, and, and Vicki. I, I have some wonderful support and helpers that help me throughout the state. And I have um, chairing my committee, Donna Bergstrom, who should be our lieutenant governor right now. Um, so I'm honored to have that support and that help. And I would be honored to have your vote at State Central. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks again for tonight. And I can take some questions too. Yeah, if you'd like a couple questions. So, okay. Uh, uh, what uh, in, in in your background? Um, what experience have you had? Like, uh, I, I know the state party handle, handles multi millions of dollars going through the campaign cycle. Um, mm -hmm. What experience have you had at dealing with that type of money? Managing money. Yeah. Managing a, a, an organization like that. Well, I'll tell you. Probably my my greatest success is when. My husband was, um, we were stationed in Okinawa, Japan, uh, doing active duty there. I couldn't have a job in Japan, so I, I volunteered for our Navy spouses organization, and we actually had a business where, it was almost like a, a Pier 1, where we, we went off to different countries, Thailand, Hong, Hong Kong, China, um, and bought, you know, furniture and, and goods, and we sold it in our shop in Okinawa, Japan. And under my leadership, um, we increased our proceeds by 40%. And in Okinawa, um, we couldn't just enjoy those profits. The, the law was that whatever money you raise, it went towards American and Japanese charities. So in that year alone, I was able to raise um, over $100,000 for charities there. So. Um, I was pretty pretty successful in managing that that business. There, I was kind of the CEO of that of that business. So very proud of that. So that's one great. example. Yeah, great question. We have one other question here. Yeah. 
Thank you. I'll just speak in Russian first. I, I love your sweater. <laughs> Thank you. So, скажите, пожалуйста, а какой же у вас все-таки план по сравнению с Манти? Манти выдал очень хорошие планы. Я понимаю его прекрасно, и я сочувствую вам, потому что мне кажется, что у вас нет такого плана. Thank you very much. Хорошо. Я я понимаю немножко, потому что это было двадцать лет назад, когда я учился русскому языку. Но я думаю, что вы говорите о плане. Может быть, я говорю по-английски, so you all can understand. I'll speak in, in English. But очень хорошо. I, I appreciate the practice in Russian. <laughs> And I, let's talk more afterwards. So a plan. You know, I'm running for a two-year term. And I'm going to promise you that I'm not going to take on the world. Um, I'm not going to, I can't do all things for all, all people. What I want to do is, number one, the day after winning the chairmanship, I will hit the ground running and, and be out there visiting with our grassroots, trying to bring as many of folks like you who are working hard for our fight for freedom all over the state of Minnesota and talking about how we can have a vision together and a message, a very strong message that we can all get behind. I can't do that alone from the, you know, from uh, a position in, um, at the top of the leadership. We have to do it together. I think that's the way we win in the future is um, bringing all these players together, the BPOUs, the congressional leadership, um, our elected leadership at the, at the legislature. I know they're looking for somebody to bring folks to the table, talk about how we're going to succeed in the future, what's our message, and work together on that. And, that. and then in the next two years, I would also like to work aggressively on raising money. Okay, one more here. Hi, Becky, thank you for running. Um, and your ending of your uh, answer to that question leads to my your answer to that question leads to my question. Um, what did you learn from Rudy Boschwitz about fundraising and how you treat volunteers? Well, Rudy, um, I learned so much from him. Such a wonderful leader. Um, he appreciated um, the hard work of everybody. I was a field rep for him in, in his uh, 1990 campaign. It took me all over Minnesota. And we made sure that we were in contact with our, our grassroots and, and asked, how can we work together? The fundraising aspect, that's where I really learned a lot was from him. He is the master, as you may know, of raising funds. And he is not afraid to sit down and just make the phone calls. As a matter of fact, I know our own RNC chair spends hours each day just calling out that, that donor community and asking for the money. You actually have to ask. And I, I feel that's what's made me successful when I, when I fight for our candidates and our causes up in, um, in Duluth and in, in CD8. You, actually, you have to ask, and you, you just, you're persistent, and you never take no for an answer. And another thing that's important is developing trust with, with the folks who you're asking to contribute to our party. So that's really important, and it means getting out there and talking to them. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for your time, I appreciate it. And we will have Jennifer Carnahan Hagedorn, our current party chair, come up and speak with us. Yes. Thank you for being here. Jennifer Carnahan. <laughs> it's great to be with you guys tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mary, for your great leadership over the years. Uh, before I get into talking about the party and all the accomplishments we've had and where we're going for 2020, I just want to make a special shout out that we have President Donald J. Trump coming to Minnesota on Monday for the third time in less than a year. This visit means more than just ironically coming on tax day. We have worked so incredibly hard over the past two years building a level of trust and positive relationships with all of our national partners, including the president, the White House administration, and his re-election team. And it's because of that effort of putting Minnesota back in a strong, trusted position that we are getting this visit on Monday. As we all know, Monday is tax day, and the president's visit 
is largely around the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed in 2017. And I think it's very important to note that it's critical that Minnesota was selected because over six million people were impacted positively by this act that was passed in 2017 through receiving bonuses, wage increases, right, more jobs created. But specifically in Minnesota, there were over 30 companies that came out publicly with how this uh, Tax Cuts and Job Act impacted them. And I just want to share a few of um, them with you today. U.S. Bank offered $1,000 bonuses to over 60,000 employees. They're a Minnesota-based company. 3M increased their uh, pension contributions for their employees by $600 million. And I own a small business on Main Street USA in Nisswa, Minnesota, a retail store. I'm not on the level of the Fortune 500 companies, but this act allowed me to give a 15% wage increase to all of my employees in my store. So there are a lot of positive stories and we are so grateful the president has selected our state to come and highlight this and talk about it as we look forward into the future. And I'll just close with uh, this about it. The Democrats can say all they want, they just keep hammering the president, everything he does, everything our party stands for. But the truth and the facts do not lie. Unemployment is down, more jobs have been created in our country, and wages continue to go up. The president is doing good things for our country, and that is why we stand behind him so solidly, why we did in 2016, and why we are again for 2020. It's been a true honor to serve as your chairwoman over the past two years. You know, everybody's kind of touched on it. You know, there are races in 20, uh, 2018 that we lost that we didn't want to lose. But let's just be honest with ourselves. The fact of the matter is, in Minnesota, Republicans haven't won a statewide race since 2006. In that time period, we've had five different chair, uh, chairs of the Republican Party. Can, is it really fair to say it's the chair's fault? I don't think so, because we are all a broad-based team that we work together. The heart and soul of our party, the candidates that get up to run, the volunteers that go out and do the door knocking, the people that raise the money, write the checks, it's us working as a team to get our Republicans elected. And unfortunately, we hit a blue wave that hit particularly hard in the suburbs and wiped all of our Republican candidates out. But you know, in elections, we see the pendulum swing all the time, every two years. And I am confident the pendulum's gonna swing back in a positive way in 2020. And I'll just say this, because all was not lost in Minnesota in 2018. We may have lost some races here in the Metro, but we were the only state in the entire country that flipped two United States House seats from Democrat to Republican. And it is, I think, important for us to lift up and note the positive things that have been done at the party over the past two years. We brought in revenues of $5.7 million this last cycle through fundraising and party transfers. At the same time, we paid down almost 35% of our party's legacy debt. And we cut the overhead expenses at the party. When I came in as chair, I was left with $19,000 in the bank. Our expenses to pay our monthly bills was $70,000 a month. I mean, think of that situation. But we worked hard, we got our party back on the right financial trajectory, and we've done a lot of good things for the party. Uh, I'm running again for chair because I believe in all of you, I believe in our opportunities, and I believe that we can win in 2020. And also I think it's important to have continuity of leadership. We've done a lot of positive things at the party, and we don't burn down the house when we've started a really solid foundation. So thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate all you do, and Mary, thanks for your great leadership. You're welcome. Thank you. I have had a couple of people sending text messages with questions, and so I think I might offer you one of those. Actually, what I'm going to do is kind of open up if you guys want to pick one of these four questions, but let's start with you. Um, this, this is coming from uh, John Augustine. Many of us know him. Um, just a great analytical mind, a great guy. He was a ch the chair of the LEA, the Legislative Evaluation Assembly of Minnesota, for many years and is still on the board. He's got four questions, and I'm thinking maybe you could just pick one and, and just, just pick one. He says, and this is just something to think about, but one, he says, once campaign season begins, what steps will you take to assure neutrality prior to endorsement even for incumbents. 
That's one question. The second one, how do you propose to keep the House and Senate Republican caucuses from deploying resources against endorsed Republican legislators who have dissented from the leadership structure? That's a good one. That could take all night. <laughs> um, three, now three, but how do you propose to keep the House and Senate caucuses, Republican caucuses, from deploying resources against endorsed Republican legislators? Yeah. And three, this is interesting. The new presidential primary law gives party chairs the option of allowing write-ins or uncommitted delegates. Choices. What do you think ought to be done? Oh, that was really interesting. And number four, his question is, what election laws ought to be changed? Why and how should they be changed? That, that's a real long one. But is there one of them out of those four you'd like to answer? Um, I can answer any one of the four. Um, Pick one. Well, they're all quite extensive. So <laughs> the, well, if we start with the fourth one, you asked about what election laws should, should be changed. And actually, this is something really important. And it kind of ties into the third question just a little bit loosely with the okay. presidential primary. Mm -hmm. So as most of you are probably aware, in um, 2020, for the first time, Minnesota is moving to a presidential primary versus the caucus system, uh, which we've had you know, in our past, which we had in 2016 in the past. And so the presidential primary brings a different approach to voting. And it was interesting because in December of 2018, it was right after the election, Secretary of State Steve Simon reached out and I went to a meeting at his office with my counterpart, Ken Martin, the chair of the Minnesota DFL. And uh, <laughs> you know, we knew that the meeting was around the presidential primary, but other than the topic, I didn't really know much more. And we walk into the meeting, and Steve Simon is basically, you know, he just starts talking, right? And he's got all the staffers around him, and, you know, it, I, I could just tell Ken Martin knew exactly every detail of this meeting, and obviously we did it. But he proposes that the entire primary should be administered by mail. Mail only for the primary. What? And then he starts bringing up, well, Minnesota passed a law that, um, you know, the, you, you have to vote on a ballot, right? So when you show up at the primary, you're either picking the red ballot, you pick the blue ballot, you know, or the Green Party ballot, right? So you have to pick the ballot. And then that information is recorded, and so the information would be shared um, back, not publicly, but back with the political parties. And the intent was always that the political parties would get all the data, and then he tried to bring forward a thing saying, um, we only want to give the Republican Party the data for the Republican ballots you know, and so forth, whereas we want all the data, right? I mean, that helps our operation. So we could see then that there was some kludgy stuff going on with the Secretary of State and obviously in conjunction with Ken Martin, but thankfully we have our Republican friends in the Senate with the majority. Senator Kiffmeyer has been a great partner on this in making sure that none of these proposed changes would go through. And Mary, this is why I come, we, we just had a great speaker come into Minnesota in March, Young Kim. She ran for Congress in California's 38th district. California, what's happened there is just insane. There's ballot harvesting. There's uh, felon voting. I mean, just name it. You can go to the door. Someone can come to your door and say, hey, let me take your ballot and turn it in for you. You don't have to show an ID. When you go to get a driver's license, <coughs> you're automatically registered to vote. So. And then there's provisional ballots, right? Absentee ballots, like we have early voting, all kinds of things. And that is what is coming down the pipe in all these states where Democrats have full control of state government. Thankfully in Minnesota, we've got the Senate. So we've got one block and this is why it's so important that we keep the Senate and bring back the House in 2020. But these are the things. Why don't people have to show an ID when they vote? That is actually absurd and ridiculous. You have to show an ID to check into a hotel. Right? You have to show an ID to, to buy a beer for everything. And so we there's to, we lots used of opportunity. To vote. We used to have. To. Yeah. Sorry, Mitch. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was interesting. So. <laughs> um, two, kind of two parts. So, one, uh, what did we see that went well that we want to learn from and keep doing? And then what was kind of the key thing that you want to pivot and do differently as we go forward? Yeah. Thanks, Tanya. I think the biggest thing that we saw that went well um, this cycle is the ground game that we worked on across the state. You know, this was the first time at the state party we had over 35 
uh, paid staffers on the ground and more than 750 volunteers trained and we strategically targeted areas of the state to make more than a million direct voter contacts. You know, 250,000 of those voter contacts were in CD2. Nearly 300,000 of those were in CD3. Obviously made almost 200,000 in CD1 and 8 and we ended up flipping those seats. The ground game delivers three to five percentage points in close elections, right? It can help be a difference maker. And I think the infrastructure uh, led by Kevin Poindexter, our executive director sitting over here, who was our state director before, and getting activists engaged and involved and out working hard across the state. It's a new culture that we built in the party and it's absolutely something that we need to continue moving forward with and double down on it in 2020. Um, the second part of your question was about opportunity areas where we could do things a little bit differently. Um, this is the biggest one. For those of you that are state central delegates or alternates, I talked about this at our state central convention in December. Our party lacks unity, collaboration, and cross-functional coordination. And we have silos in this party. The House Republican Caucus works in their own silo. Um, the Senate, you know, we, we partner uh, more positively with the Senate, but there's still some differences there. And then you have each of the candidates that wants to do their own things, right? And everybody's kind of marching forward in their own way. When you go look at the Democrats on the other side, they're just one team. Everything runs as one strategy, one political operation. They work together on fundraising, and they go out and attack the state. And that's why they were able to reach so many more voters than we were. And that, Tanya, I think is our, quite frankly, our biggest opportunity. But so all you know, we have been working on that. We've sat down with uh, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazalka. We've sat down with Minority Leader Kurt Dowd and the House leadership. And we're working with our state executive board and our party leaders to figure out how we can be more cohesive and aligned and united in our political operations and go for a direction for 2020. All right. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Got Two quick more. No. I can come. Yeah. Madam Chair, um, do you see? Are we just? Are we going to be working election cycles, or is this turned into a full, full annual job? This is an annual job, and I think um, many of you in this room know. As soon as we got past November sixth, obviously a lot of us were disappointed. We went out and started doing an autopsy and started getting feedback. We sat down with every statewide candidate, all of our congressionals, sat down with the House and Senate, and really got feedback and talked through everything with all these uh, different uh, key individuals that ran for office. And then we started looking at what do we need to do? Where do we need to go? How do we need to start moving for 2020? And that's what we did. We recently, over the past couple months, have launched several critical councils to the state party. Barb talked about one of them in her speech, the Grassroots Leadership Council, which is gonna be focused on providing more resources and uniting the grassroots around shared operations, shared opportunities, you know, candidate recruitment, fundraising, all the operational things that they need to know. Our affiliate groups, and Barb talked about this as well. We have to stop looking at our, as our affiliate groups as just having affiliate groups. We need to have affiliate groups that have clear goals into lining up to the parties opportunities and vision to growing in these diverse communities. You know, it's great to say, hey, we're holding a convention, you know, at the Urban League in North Minneapolis. That's not outreach, right, to that community. You know, showing up and walking in a parade, uh, a monk parade, it's great, but that's not outreach. Outreach is making authentic connections, showing up, building relationships with these people and staying there and not going away. So we're working on that strategy as well. A really big one, is the suburban women vote in two and three, and many of the people in this room are on that council, uh, Jen Zielinski, Kathy Tinglestad, uh, Vicki. We, we just went through a great exercise on Tuesday night, I guess it was, and we are tackling the suburbs. We've got a multifaceted strategy that's moving forward to do some women research and find out what matters, and then we have a fourth council as well, but I'm running out of time, so. <laughs> And Mitch is going to come up and uh, pull me off stage. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My question for you is, um, how would you, um, what kind of teamwork did you provide to um, Minnesota Representative Jim Newberger as he ran in the U.S. Senate race? And what kind of collaboration did you do with his campaign when you sent out three fundraising letters that did not mention his name? 
And how would you say that that's good continuity to move forward into the future with that kind of a winning strategy? We actually provided a lot of collaboration and partnership with all of our campaigns. Thank you, Christina, for the question. Um, we touched base with all of the campaigns consistently throughout the campaign. This was one of Kevin's core areas, and he did a phenomenal job at it. All of our candidates were included on our scripts when we went out door knocking. Um, the statement about Jim Neuberger not being included on all the fundraising mailers is actually not accurate. Um, just so people are aware, when you do direct fundraising mailers, you can only really talk about three candidates in depth. Uh, we had three mailers after the endorsing convention in June in uh, Duluth, and Jim Newberger was, Jeff Johnson and Karen Housley were on all of them because those were, you know, governor and U.S. Senate as the top two targeted key races uh, by national and also in Minnesota. Jim Newberger was on one of the mailers. Doug Wardlow was on one of the mailers. My husband, Jim Hagedorn, and Pete Stauber were on the third mailer. Jim Newberger was on every telemarketing script we did as well as our telemarketing direct response mailers. So actually, after Jeff Johnson and Karen Housley, Jim Newberger was included in the most direct response efforts from the party. I personally, along with Dave Pasco and our other leaders, drove around the state and showed up at events specifically for Jim Newberger. And personally, I contributed, and I'm not a person with a ton of extra cash sitting around $250 of my own money to him, and gave him names of major donors on my call list that I've built relationships with over two years to help him out. So we went above and beyond to work collaboratively with all of our candidates. And you know what? I respect Jim so much for running because if there was, that is the toughest race in the entire state. Amy Klobuchar typically wins with 70% of the vote and the fact that he was willing to get up and go work to give us a choice should be commended and celebrated, and we respect him for that immensely. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Good job. All right. All right.